changed sides. So before I get into the topic at hand, I just want to give you a very quick kind of rundown of my own um, research profile and it, because it creates a type of a context within which the current work is arising. And I've, I've, I've long been interested in questions around um, climate resources and data. And I think I've juxtaposed those terms very differently depending on the setup, but that's the kind of the current feel I'm having. And I've, my field sites have primarily, I'm an anthropologist, so I kind of primarily traffic in ethnographic studies um, and my field sites have been in Iceland and Denmark. Um, my first kind of major kind of study was of conflicts between fishermen and uh, marine scientists uh, after the introduction of a quota system in Iceland. And I focus very much there on the, the different types of data that were generated to make claims about the disappearance of large fish stocks uh, off the northwest coast. Um, my PhD project, um, as as Phil mentioned, was a, a study of energy extraction in Iceland. And here I did ethnographic fieldwork with geologists. Um, and they were really kind of mainly trying to prevent anthropogenic earthquakes that were been triggered from extractive activities. So I spent some time with them and some time with also the local inhabitants who were experiencing these earthquakes. And I'm writing a book now, which is based on the PhD, and that's mainly about the forms of temporality and politics that anthropogenic earthquakes, I suppose you could say, co-produce in what I'm calling these ungovernable landscapes. Um, more recent work has been examining the rise of the data center industry in Denmark, and particularly its environmental inflections. And so this work will be probably more known to you guys. Um, and what I'm writing about uh, in more recent times, at least kind of in the last few months, is the ways in which, at least in Denmark, and I think this is becoming an issue maybe across Europe, the way data centers are becoming enrolled in decarbonization strategies. So that's kind of a flip, you know, the kind of a flip of the discourse, at least away from the kind of hugely energy intensive entities that they are into how they can actually be a climate boom by using the excess heat that comes from the data centers as a way uh, to integrate it into local district heating systems. So that's some stuff I've been focusing on. And then we've just started, and I just wanted to say this and I'll stop this here now. Uh, we've just started a new ERC funded project called Decoupling IT. And this is a kind of an attempt to look at how it is that the IT industry is responding to climate change. Um, and we're using decoupling uh, as one of the primary mechanisms for uh, achieving it. So like decoupling as the primary policy response from governments all over the world, so forms of green growth. So what is, is it that this decoupling stuff is about? Um, and that's just started, uh, and that's a five-year gig, so we'll have that until 2028. So that's we hope to see some uh, exciting research coming from that. Today's presentation is based on a new project uh, I've become involved in, um, and that's an ethnographic study of an initiative called Grow Your Own Cloud. And these are a collective of, uh, I suppose, artists, designers, and now scientists uh, and they're based uh, in Copenhagen, in Berlin and in Paris, depending on the time of year. They, they get about a little bit on the European scene. And the idea at the heart of their work is an attempt to store data in organic materials. So in flowers, in plants, and more recently, they've been talking about small forests. And just to um, speak to what Estrel said at the start, this research is really new and it's not as far on as I had imagined. So I think that my abstract may have been over promising a little bit. So. Um, I, I really would like you guys to help me think about some of the stuff that I'm presenting today um, in as generative way as you can, as you can muster. So Grow Your Own Cloud, they see when the, they frame their work as a response to what they call the data problem. And for them, that's actually a dual set of problems. Um, the first is how to develop more just and equitable data collectivities. And the second one, and at the same time, is how to address the role of data and data infrastructures in the heating of the planet. Although, as you'll probably see as I get through this talk, it seems like the latter idea, the climate idea, tends to uh, take precedence over the former. And their proposition is that we can build data infrastructures that are more localized, more collectivized, and essentially carbon negative. In fact, they described their project and the development of it uh, through what they call the building of speculative prototypes. And I'll get into that in a, a little bit later, what that means. But for now, I just want to paint a slightly broader canvas in which projects like Grow Your Own Cloud, and they're not the only one out there, but that project and projects of their ilk, uh, uh, what kind of what, what space they sit in. And so this the proliferation of these terms uh, and these images won't be news to anyone here. But nonetheless, the vision of the future that it signals, one awash with data, is still very, very commonplace. And the estimates of data traffic 
and storage are varied and they fall within this huge range of numbers. So, I mean, the latest one I've seen is from 175 to 418 zettabytes. So that's monstrous, right? And leaving aside how we actually count these things, which is actually a really important question, the context that drives the broader data, the broader tech industry uh, in these projects is one of storage. So how can we find the means to store so much data in the future at scales that work both technically and economically? And industry proponents suggest that at this rate of development, current magnetic and optical data storage technologies won't be enough. So the idea is that silicon chips are fasting approaching their capacity limits. And so we're facing a serious problem. And the serious problem as they frame it is how can we manage such data flows into the future? But there's very little recognition of this being any, in any way connected to a resource issue. Instead, what we get is a very kind of uh, unsurprisingly narrow and technicalized framing where slowing down or finding alternatives to the current structure of the data economy isn't part of the problem space. And so we're left with kind of more classic circular, circular technological logics. And that is, how do we find new forms of technology in order to solve our current technological impasse? And this is where DNA enters the picture. And the guiding proposition here is an invitation to reimagine the future of storage and hence much of the uh, data economy through the lens of DNA as a primary storage medium. So let's take a quick look at what this reimagining proposes. So what's very common is to get a mini history of the powers and potentials of DNA. And that goes um, a little bit like this. Well, except my clients are not working. <laughs> Hold on a second. Yes, yeah, sorry. So the idea, well, the, the history that you get is that DNA has been storing our genetic code for billions of years. So in many ways, uh, you can see it as biology, biology's data storage system par excellence. It's, a, it's dense, it's durable, and it's easy to manipulate. So the idea is that this opens up the doorways of huge storage potential. And the tech industry are investigating and also investing in ways to translate digital data, so ones and zeros, into biological data, so DNA assets, and also vice versa. DNA storage is being robustly put forward as one of the new frontiers in biotech. And of course, for anyone trafficking at the intersection of technology and society will know that New frontiers is the kind of version that biotech does best, right? So there's always a new, there's always at some point a new frontier. Um, and the imaginary that's uh, articulated by the industry is that it will use a fraction of the physical space of contemporary server farms and hence use far fewer resources than we currently do. So, you know, in terms of the value chain of uh, data centers, all of the kind of upstream and downstream resources, including mining and metals, and of course, waste and so forth. So the idea is that that will be at a real, real uh, minimum. Um, in talking to the guys in Grow Your Own Cloud, they of course refer to other types of projects that are underway. And one of their favorite ones to talk about is one at Harvard. And here in this kind of like, I think kind of super interesting, if not very hubristic image, it imagines the progress of humanity through its data storage technologies. So we start out at, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner with painting, we stored data through painting and then writing. And then we had the advent of printing and the revolution of bits in the 60s. And now they kind of earmark 18, uh, 2018 as the year of that DNA came onto the scene. And it's already been done with synthetic DNA. Uh, researchers have been translating a host of what they call uh, important cultural heritage items. So including, as you can see here, Shakespeare's sonnets and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Although right now, using synthetic DNA is expensive, it's slower, and it erodes quickly over time. And here's the process of DNA storage as laid out by, G uh, by Grow Your Own Cloud. And this is, uh, they have a fairly sophisticated website, actually, and I would encourage you to have a look at it. Um, but this is the basic process. So ones and zeros are encoded into acid bases. So A, C, G, and T via software. This is synthesized and sequenced into synthetic DNA. Importantly, that's in liquid form. And then this, this liquid can then uh, be injected into, for example, a plant 
plant or a flower or some or, or a tree for that sake. So you can think of that as the upload phase. The down the download phase, and that's the move back from plants into data, is achieved through genetic sequencing technology, where the liquid is decoded back into data formats. The near ambition, the, the near term ambitions are to facilitate organizations who don't require immediate access to their data in some type of cold storage DNA form. Over time, it's claimed this will be cheaper, more secure, and apparently better for the environment. But the way that the tech industry imagined this is very powerful. They envisage a, a kind of a vast global scaling up of DNA storage technologies. And they go so far as to say that all the information currently stored in one large hyperscale data center could be contained into the space roughly the size of a few dice. So in many ways, the imaginary suggests going from this and all that implies into this. So it's, it's unclear to me, as of yet at least, how Grow Your Own Cloud position themselves vis-a-vis -vis big tech. And what was originally a kind of a, boot, a, a more boutique designer, artsy intervention, um, the, the language on their website has changed kind of quite significantly over the last six months. And they variably call themselves now a research project and also a startup. So uh, it seems at least clear from their website that they have developed ambitions to scale up and to marketize. So that's the sense of moving out of the more collectivist thinking into a uh, kind of a startup, how do, how, how do we go about making this into something that works in the world? Um, and the group have developed what they call uh, speculative prototypes. And the first, and that's kind of like three different types of projects which have some sort of speculative proposition at the heart of them. The first was about a data flower shop. And in this setting, the focus uh, was on soliciting reactions from people who wanted to come into, this cloud, uh, into the flower shop and kind of rethink the cloud in some way. And so the idea was, an essential idea is, what would it be like for them to store meaningful data in organic material? And I'm gonna play this little short three minute video for you, because I think it has a lot in it and it says a lot. And it's a, it's a nice kind of, uh, I suppose, a moment of analysis. And then we'll say, so I'll talk some more after when I've just played this. Please do let me know if this you can't hear this. You should be able to. So someone please shout out if you can't. We launched a website where people were asked to mindfully select data to upload and book an appointment to encode their data to a plant, removing it from the distant privatized cloud and transferring it to something more intimate and tangible. We transformed a local flower shop into a decentralized data center. We use this familiar environment to explore the unique characteristics of plants while raising issues around data storage and introducing scientific possibilities through storytelling to stir curiosity and provoke ethical considerations. Each appointment began with a personal consultation from a data growth expert who guided clients through the data to DNA encoding process, converting uploaded files like JPEGs and MP3s into ACGTs and synthetic DNA. We use data prescriptions to explore people's data stories and requirements while educating them on the possibilities of using DNA data storage such as unfathomable storage capacity, hyperlongevity and the ability to cross-pollinate or replant data. Once we had helped the client select a plant, we visited the on-site lab where a data scientist was on hand to demonstrate three laboratory techniques they could be used to insert synthetic DNA containing data to an organism like a plant. The data scientist used the visitor's prescription to decide upon a particular technique, explaining each of the possibilities and their implications. Next, our data florist advised clients on how to care for their plant to ensure their data would bloom and grow. We created a data center card that lived with the plant, providing key information and care instructions. Each visitor left with an encoded plant and a special download kit, allowing them to send us a sample of their encoded plant, which we could use to read their data back. Our aim was to immerse visitors in a new world of possibilities, inform them about a set of growing issues, empower them to think differently, 
and leave them with a fresh perspective. The response was wonderful, both online with our experience fully booked and extremely rich, positive and insightful feedback from everyone who visited on the day. Grow Your Own Cloud is a self-initiated project made possible through collaboration. In particular, we engage with plant geneticists and biohackers in gene editing labs to experiment and refine our ideas. We use the uncanny setting of the local flower shop come data center to exhibit artistic techniques outside of the gallery or bringing science to life outside of the laboratory. We hope that this work, immersing visitors in a world of new possibilities, scientific processes and ethical considerations, particularly around current behaviors related to data and the usage of genetic modification, can be extended and serve as a platform for further investigation to explore and propose novel use cases for plant-based data storage while creating a new affinity with nature. Okay. That was the first one. The first was like I'll speculate the prototype. And the second one um, was about data gardens. And here, I, there's another video of this, but I won't play this one. It's a little, it's, it's, there's a lot of repetition in their videos. This one is what they, I mean, they call it a speculative prototype, but then they call it, we've moved into re the reality of a data garden. And what they really mean by that is that they man managed not just to get data into plants, but to decode it down again. So they got both the upload and the download phase to work. Um, and they're very uh, happy about that. I'm going to skip that. And then the third one, the and this is not, it's kind of it's not the final one, but it's the one that they've been working on most recently. And this is kind of like, you know, moving from the idea of talking to people about flowers and plants into kind of what they call an end-to-end -end system of uploading and downloading, and now kind of scaling up even more into something that they call urban data forests, which is kind of like mainly just a patches of trees kind of dispersed around uh, urban locations. Um and the idea here is to move from plants as data to forests as data infrastructure. And there's currently they have two versions, of, there's two versions of this that they're working with also in collaboration with other groups. And the first is called the Breathing Museum. And this is a project based out of The Hague, which is supposed, which it archives public and cultural data. And let me just give you, I'm gonna read out something to you. It's like, just to give you a sense of the language that they use to describe this. So they say, quote, it offers a calm meditative space where the public are invited to explore digital archives and cultural works through their contact with living organisms such as trees and shrubs. This type of urban data forest is simultaneously an organic archive and a contemporary cultural institute. As an archive, it, it preserves significant local data, including scans of old maps, rare books, and historical photos. Snapshots of modern life are also regularly added, such as viral videos and social media announcements related to The Hague. And then the second version of this is something called Living Archive. And this is the idea that these um, kind of like urban forest areas are kind of dedicated to communities that live in the locality for them to store their data. And here citizens and communities get to grow or they get to own plots as such and then care for their data. And this can be open source or encrypted data depending on the needs of the person or group or community in play. And I'm gonna play you again in, uh, another video because I think that there's a lot of super interesting stuff in this one. Um, and I'm just, I just have to skip through it uh, into a particular point. So just bear with me for a second. You can hear that? I feel pretty fortunate and basically like this to do what I do in the middle of the city. The smells change every few steps. Sometimes I think I know this forest better than my living room. I go out into forests looking and caring for data. I work in a living archive. It's full of all kinds of data these days. There are local families using the living archives to store their files. Over here, for example, is the plot of the Van den Bosch family. I know one of them has hidden a really precious family NFT here. 
This tree has photos from the Gurr family. I've helped some of them trace their roots. Literally. I work with bio-archivists who know everything about the data stored in these archives. There are archivists and synthetic biologists who transform digital media into sequences of DNA for storage in plants and trees. We also have a data migration team. We keep everyone updated with how data is spreading in the forest through pollination. Then there's us, the data harvesters. We know how to read nature. We can identify plants. We're excellent foragers. We know where everything grows or where it's likely to be. We also specialize in caring for the plants and the data inside to ensure they stay healthy. If a plant is unwell, its data is backed up across multitudes of backups. When I started working here, I was also trained how to use the DNA sequences. I always carry one with me to use in the field. It's still a beautiful process, I think. Taking a leaf, examining it, wondering what's inside. Running a sample can take a while. It's slow work, almost meditative. One of the things that drew me to this life was the vision. The idea of building futuristic infrastructure but having it function more like a public service than a tech company. I don't consider myself a tech worker. To me that sounds more like those old jobs, developing software for Google or picking items at Amazon. In the old archives, a few people decide what should be kept. In the living archives, we work with local communities to decide what should be stored. Here we always ask, what should be preserved and what should return to the soil? I feel more like being a forest guardian or a data explorer. I feel myself as part of an ecosystem within the urban setting, which makes it even harder when you see something you feel connected to dying. Yet, it starts to make sense when you understand that in this system, nothing really ends. There are simply new beginnings. Oopsie, sorry. Okay, so there's a lot, I think there's a lot going on in that video. Um, it's kind of like an all, like he even says it himself, like a meditative tour with an altogether different type of future tech worker. So it's one who practices like a slow, caring form of data labor in contrast to the otherwise aggressive or vulnerable uh, contemporary tech worker. And there's a kind of a strange uh, intimacy here in the knowledge of the roots, both like literal and metaphorical, and an intimacy that's supposed to work for the public good. And then there's like talk of pollination and regeneration and death and renewal. But despite that, there's still the retention of forms of language that are less resonant with those types of themes. So harvesting, guardianship, and exploration. And I think that this ecotech imaginary for data storage is really fascinating. And this is how one of the researchers describes it. And again, apologies for the long quotes in the videos, but as I said, I'm still at quite an early phase. And so imagine walking through a park that's actually a library every plant, flower, and shrub full of archived information. You sit down on a bench, touch your handheld DNA reader to a leaf, and listen to the Rolling Stones directly from it. Or choose a novel or watch a documentary amid the greenery. One simple tree could provide all of the edu educational data anywhere in the world. And this is, of course, quite different from the large-scale planet computing projects that are out there and one example of this is Microsoft's 2020 launch of their planetary computer. So this is a more classic uh, computing infrastructure that aims to aggregate data on biodiversity, water, forestry, carbon, waste across the world. And so the, the idea here is to translate the, uh, the planet into a type of data so we can intervene in an array of problem spaces uh, with the use and help of AI and machine learning and so forth. So there's a real kind of logic of programmability that's evident here. And it's one that reminds me of Wendy Chun, uh, her distinction when she talks about the ways in which there's a kind of a, uh, how programmability sits in this kind of like heightened awareness of uncertainty that the climate crisis is producing. 
But data forests are, and the other the, the other organic materials like plants and flowers, they're kind of altogether different to these other what well, are more classic computational infrastructures, right? And they're less about computational infrastructures generating data about the planet and more about the planet as infrastructure. And again, this is not still not the same as Ashley Carse's, I think by now kind of classic notion of nature as infrastructure. And this is a form of programmability that is something deeper and more penetrative. And I think that this has all sorts of implications and connotations, not least of which is our own recent growing awareness of the almost magical uh, mycelial networks through which interspecies communities live and thrive. So I think in, in many ways, projects such as Grow Your Own Cloud, they're offering uh, and kind of perpetuating a very exciting ecotech vision of integrating nature and technology in new and climate friendly ways. But I suppose the, oh, the, the where my head is at right now is like, what does it mean to digitalize nature in this way? And what new forms of nature emerge at this intersection? I suppose also where might this end, right? So potentially uploading digital data, not just into forests as, as we've just seen, um, but also into more familiar organic forms. And Grow Your Own Cloud are very clear about emphasizing collectivity and locality, climate and ethics, but it's still very unclear to me as of now what these terms actually mean to them. And I've begun to think, uh, I've recently been reading a book by Alberto Corzin Jimenez, who, I don't know if you guys know him, but he's an anthropologist, uh, studied in Cambridge and is based in, in Spain. Um, and he was mobilizing the term prototype. And it's not a kind of a new term, but I think he does a lot of good work with it. So and he, he has a book uh, called Prototyping Cultures, Art, Science and Politics in Beta. And he argues that a prototype is both a descriptor for onto-epistemic objects and a mode of making such objects, right? So as an onto-epistemic object, a prototype is a beta or a work in progress version of something and a good way of thinking about an entity in the making. So he says prototyping is a provisional way and an experimental mode of practice that offers us a way of thinking about the status of things that are not quite yet objects or in this case, things that are not quite yet infrastructures. And these qu not quite yet are prefigurations of both things and of sociality as they model the possibility of what's to come. And I suppose he uses again a nice term, which is not uncommon these days, technologies of anticipation, prototypes they model or rehearse particular versions of the future. And right now, I'm very curious about what it is that these speculative prototypes are prefiguring. So what type of worlds are they actively rehearsing? And my initial feeling is um, uh, that there's actually like huge tensions at play in these imaginaries about DNA. And I suppose it wouldn't be very difficult to argue that the entire problem of climate change is part and parcel of the Euro-American desire to conquer and colonize the planet's resources at will. And we see this not only in the past, which is evidence of this type of picture, this type of imagery, but also in visions of the future as multi-planetary enthusiasts like Bezos and Musk claim that colonizing outer space is the best way to solve the climate crisis. And there's something quite interesting, if not a little bananas going on here, I think, when the solution to one form of colonialism that's put the future of the planet in jeopardy is another form of multi-planetary colonialism or the colonizing of outer space. And I'm wondering if we might think of the turn to DNA in similar terms. Well, it, again, it's not quite clear to me how Grow Your Own Cloud reconcile the dual aspects of the data problem as they frame it. And just to, to remind you what that is, that's the impulse towards local data collectivities alongside the impulse to colonize flowers or plants or small forests at the genetic level. And it strikes me um, right now, at least, that the drive to change the structures of the data economy and address the forms of, the, of data colonialism that we see in our midst um, are secondary, I suppose, to the broader climate problem where we continue to see solutions to problems through the more troubled optics of colonizing and extraction. Except in this, this sense, it's through a deeper colonizing drive into the inner genomic spaces of DNA. I suppose you could say that the colonizing logic of extraction has allowed us to see the natural world as but one set of resources to be harvested. And in, in the first instance, in order to build civilization, and now in order to save it. 
And so I think that there's um, very, very many interesting questions that projects such as Grow Your Own Cloud raise. And right now, uh, it's my sense that they offer a kind of a, they offer a fascinating look at the imaginaries and ethics and play in the making of ecotech futures. Okay, that's enough for me. Um, I think I've just kind of slightly run over time, but I, um, and as I said, this is kind of uh, I, there's a, I, my hope was to give you guys some material uh, that you could help me to think with in terms of like you know how to move forward with this project. What is it that strikes you as uh, interesting, uh, and or what is it that you you think could be uh, kind of an interesting way to go about this type of research? <laughs>